24 minutes to the hour of 7 o'clock. Welcome back to the Morning Brew. We do have the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago here with us, the Honorable Faris Al-Rawi, to talk to us about what happened in the Parliament on Friday. Good morning to you, Mr. Attorney General. How are you doing this morning? Good morning to you and to Trinidad and Tobago. I'm fine, thank you. Very good to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for being on the Morning Brew. We always appreciate your presence here. Thank you. So on Friday, I actually heard your contribution in the Parliament and Rodney Charles. It was my drive time, so thank God I was able to hear you what, what you were saying about the anti-gang legislation. But the opposition decided not to support the bill, uh, citing that you have not shown where it has been effective in the last 30 years because there is zero conviction. How do you respond to that? Well, I must tell you that I was very surprised and very disappointed at the opposition's vote. The parliament was informed in the pre-organization uh, um, of this debate that the opposition had deep constitutional concerns with the legislation. At the debate on the floor of the parliament, regrettably, um, the speakers that spoke for the opposition did not tell us any issue um, that was in the realm of constitutional law. Um, they did, however, speak to um, simple generalities, asking for uh, positions on what exactly was to be shown by way of effectiveness of the legislation. We were able to demonstrate by way of Trinidad and Tobago statistical information coming from the TTPS that there had been a near 57% reduction in gang membership, which is referred to as suppression. I referred the opposition to the fact that one of the main aims of the legislation, and that legislation is legislation put in the parliament by the opposition when government was to cause the suppression of gang activity. We showed that statistical information also revealed a 50% reduction in the number of gangs itself. We revealed 88 persons had been put before the courts for charges under the anti-gang legislation. We revealed that that included a significant number of gang leaders. We informed via the Minister of National Security, no less a person, that that very morning, a well-known, reputed gang leader had been brought before the courts. As it relates to convictions, as you're well aware, the criminal justice system in Trinidad and Tobago does not move at the pace it ought to. We are in the case of having demonstrated to the Parliament that we have, from the Chief Justice's annual report to the Parliament this year, seen a significant increase in the rapidity and movement of cases through the system. We informed that we have moved from 36 to 64 judges, 12 to 15 in the Court of Appeal, from two masters to 25 masters to case manage. We showed the addition of 129 new courts, the reduction in the magisterial caseload. In other words, then, all the metrics going in the right direction. We didn't receive any further commentary. At the committee stage, we asked for this law to be um, set in terms of the record. We very importantly demonstrated that the anti-gang law is related to the money laundering and white collar crimes in Trinidad and Tobago. And we pointed to the use of the Interception of Communication Act for the bugging of prisons. We showed how the follow the money civil asset forfeiture legislation follows that. We informed that there were matters concerning unexplained wealth orders in the courts that related to this. And in all the circumstances, we asked for 13 months again to continue the life of this legislation, indicating that it was appropriate specifically because courts are now closed for jury trials due to the COVID pandemic. We said, had it not been for that, we would have been willing to look at what the time frame should be. That law having collapsed for the third time, it's not the second time, it's the third time it collapsed. It collapsed in 2016, it collapsed in 2017, and now it has collapsed again. It means that on the 29th of November 2020, anti-gang laws go from the books of Trinidad and Tobago and suppression of gang activity falls apart. The no. gang activity suppression. AG, I hear you on the statistics for 
50% um, reduction in the number of gangs, 57% reduction, and 88% put before courts for charges under anti-gang legislation. But according to Rodney Charles, in 2000, I think he said 18, maybe it was 17, you said that there are over 2,500 gang members. And when you stood up in the parliament, you said over, I think it was 30, 138 that were charged. But if, if 2,500 plus and only 130, their argument is that it's not effective, it's not doing enough. Sure, perhaps if I could clarify that. Yeah. In 2018, I said, based upon intelligence from the agencies, that we had identified 2,200 persons as members of gangs. We said that this anti-gang law put in 2018 would cause the suppression of gang members. We referred to the judgment of Mr. Justice Nolan Barrow, who gave guidelines on the constitutionality and how one ought to operate the law. And in fact, what we said in 2020 is that number went down from 2,200 to 1,100. So we showed effectiveness. Why weren't 2,200 people charged under the Anti-Gang Act? Because as the Justice of Appeal put it out, this is no slander case. You need to make sure that the evidence is compelling. When we reported 138 people charged in 2018, by that point, it was demonstrating the people charged under the UNC's tenure. Under the UNC's tenure, thousands of people were charged under the Anti-Gang Act in state of emergency, and thousands were let go. There were 138 legacy matters. One of them resulted in a conviction. The rest of them resulted in false imprisonment and malicious prosecution charges. And I want to remind you, when the court asked for justification for the state of emergency, so the court could hear why people ought not to get false imprisonment and malicious prosecution charges, two people were called by the state to give evidence, Kamala Prasad Bissessa and Anand Ram Logan, and both refused to give evidence on behalf of the state. In 2020, we have said that we, as government, have been told by the police service that 88 people have been brought before the courts and that the overall reduction has been dramatic with a 25% reduction in murders at the same time. It's very important to note, Mr. Charles said that murders went down because of the COVID measures. He pointed out a number of jurisdictions where that had happened. When we checked, those jurisdictions were under a curfew and state of emergency. If you look at Chicago, you look at LA, they have had a 100% increase in crime during COVID. So the data which came from Mr. Charles was anecdotal. It was not grounded in fact. And in fact, I, I had complained that Mr. Charles said, don't look at the statistics. Right, so you know, so now that this has happened and it has failed, as you said, the third time, what is going to happen with those people who are charged under the anti-gang legislation since there will be no legislation after November 29th, 2020? People who are before the courts on expired law will continue to be before the courts on expired law. That's the general principle. However, in gang-related matters, it is in the process of trial and in the process of further investigation, that you may very well find the need to charge other persons. So other persons or tangential or connected matters may very well fall apart. One cannot speak for the judiciary. As you recall, when the sedition law was partially struck down, the courts took the opportunity in one instance, for instance, with Mr. Watson Duke, to relieve him of charges because the law had been amended and had come to an end and the court felt that there was no useful purpose in continuing. I cannot speak for what a court will do. So general principle, those before the courts will continue, but what we will have lost is the ability to charge further persons under the law, because there will be no law, and very importantly, that gang suppression will be killed, and that is tied into our Interception of Communication Act. We passed interception of communication legislation to allow us to bug the prisons in areas outside of where you speak to your lawyer. That legislation, we are now under pre-action protocol by persons who are accustomed to representing the UNC. 
who are threatening to sue on that legislation to set it aside. That law is also the anti-gang law connected to the unexplained wealth law. We have several matters before the courts. That law is also connected to matters, for instance, anecdotally involving arrangements like the drug susu matter or other um, allegations of money laundering, matters which come out of the demonetization of money. So there are lots of connected principles which will now be crushed. Few matters related. Right. And, you know, while I hear you, Mr. Attorney General, uh, Ms. Uh, Senator Lutch Medial did have a conference to say at the end of the day, it's rubbish to say that they won't give the government support. But the reality is she reiterates the, reiterates the point that it's just not effective because in their mind, if there is zero conviction and if there are still gang members about after 30 months, then what is the point of 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 threatening people's constitutionality by locking them up for an extended period of time, not being able to get bail if at the end of the day there is no conviction to show for it. If we were to accept that argument most respectfully, then we would immediately be abolishing the law to treat with hanging. We would abolish the law in relation to rape. We would abolish the law in relation to assault. We would abolish the law in relation to domestic violence. We would abolish the law in relation to money laundering, complex fraud, and... You see, if you accept that argument, show me a conviction. We have umpteen matters for white-collar offenses where there's been no conviction. We have one matter involving complex fraud that is now 22 years old in the system. We have people on death row awaiting trial. There's no conviction in some of those instances. So if you take Senator Lutch Medial's position most respectfully, I think that she was compelled to take an argument that she herself probably didn't believe, because that argument would mean, well, look, let's just throw out all the laws of Trinidad and Tobago and get rid of it. Importantly, let's accept the argument in part. What are we doing to catalyze and move convictions along faster? Those are the reforms in the criminal justice system, which I mentioned a while ago. Doubling the judiciary, adding 129 new courts, creating a criminal division, a family division, having 15,000 matters done by video hearing, having judge-only trials, including murder trials, having 25 uh, magistrates put uh, onto the bench to case manage. The Chief Justice's report this year showed that the amendments that we had caused up to October this year and May this year resulted in nearly a 46% reduction in caseload in the magistracy. So the system is moving in a much more efficient way right now. It is respectfully the wrong time to come up with an argument that says, show me no conviction and therefore throw away the law. So if, what's going to happen next? Now that this has collapsed, the anti-gang legislation has collapsed, and we saw that the, the United National Congress did not support the uh, amendments to the bail amendment bill either were gone, control is concerned, if I, if, my, if I get it correctly. You can put it in legal terms for me, where people who have been caught with military-grade weapons could be detained for 120 days without bail, did not support that as well. So what's going to happen with these matters are going forward where legislation is concerned? Do you return this to the order paper? Do you try again? How soon can you try to get it back on the books? So Standing Order 78 of the House of Representatives prohibits the return of legislation which is similar to one which is defeated within a period of six months unless there is effectively consent between the opposition and government. Obviously, the government would immediately return this legislation if the UNC recanted on its position. I'm quite confident that what is really required in this connection is for the people of Trinidad and Tobago to consider what they wish. The law as it is standing um, up until the 29th of November is good law. You have this law demonstrating 88 serious gang members and gang leaders before the courts, and you have the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service telling you there's been a near 57% reduction in, in, in the number of members in gangs and a 25% reduction in murders. Those are not small statistics. I believe that the opposition's um, run out into the um, public domain yesterday and over the weekend 
is perhaps demonstrative of the belief that they may have got this wrong. Let's see what happens in terms of the advocacy by people in Trinidad and Tobago. This government can only pass laws with 23 votes. We cannot pass special majority legislation without the support of the, of the opposition. The opposition has often capitulated on positions such as this under public pressure. This is, I believe, a very important issue. And let's see what the rest of society has to say. And what, what has the response been from the rest of society? Have you gotten any feedback as yet? Uh, well, yes. from the chambers of commerce, from business people, from the community about the opposition's the lack of support for this piece of legislation? Yes, I, I can tell you that umpteen chambers of commerce have reached out to me throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. Civil society has reached out. I'm talking about people in the thousands in terms of those who represent them in these committees. They are shocked and appalled at this position some of these members indicated that they had met with the opposition prior to the debate and that they were under no um, concern that the opposition would necessarily refuse to support. They were appalled at this position. I understand that they intend to put their positions in the public domain. Uh, the government, of course, respects the views of all stakeholders, including the opposition. Let me say this most sincerely. We did not hear from the opposition a single line in relation to a clause in the law or a section in the existing law that needed to be amended or adjusted. There was none of that. All that we heard from the opposition was, we have no statistics. We presented the statistics coming from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Remember, we're speaking with the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Faris al Rawi, the Honorable Faris al Rawi, about the fact that the anti-gang legislation failed to get the opposition to support in the House on Friday and what happens going forward. So, Mr. al Rawi, I, one of the things that I also heard from Rodney Charles is that it's asking the government to bring procurement legislation, that if you really want to treat with crime, you have to deal with certain things such as the procurement legislation. Not for Mr. Charles, but on my behalf, when will we see this being brought to the House? Sure. So I can tell you that there is a miscellaneous provisions bill and that that bill contains some amendments to the Public Procurement Act, which we have been asked by the Public Procurement Regulator to bring to the Parliament. Um, there are two issues um, effectively standing in there. Um, and I'd like to tell you for the record that it was only upon my return as Attorney General in the month of October when I met with the Public Procurement Regulator, and then in November, when I received draft regulations from the regulator, that we are now in an able, to, able position to do that. I want to remind the delay in the operationalization of this law is largely due to the fact that only the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago had the legal capacity to appoint the Public Procurement Regulator. That took many years um, post 2015, it was Mr. Ju Mr. Justice of Appeal, now President, past President Anthony Carmona, who in fact appointed the Public Procurement Regulator and its board. After that appointment, they had to engage in the creation of draft regulations. I can confirm that in the month of November 2020, that is now, I received the final draft regulations from the Public Procurement Regulator. I want to assure you that the government intends to move with immediacy. I can expect all things being equal to get that bill into Parliament by next Friday. This all Friday right. is private member's bill. We're speaking with the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. We're looking at the anti-gang legislation. But you're saying to me, Mr. Alrao, before we went to the break, that the procurement legislation will be in the House by next Friday. Yes, and I'd like to, if you allow me a second, to put public procurement into context. Public procurement is not so much an issue in Antigan. Public procurement is the desire of this government in relation to our follow the money legislation. We have introduced campaign finance legislation, which is now in the parliament. That is the companion law to public procurement law. 
we have introduced explain your wealth legislation. We have removed um, the concept of hiding behind legal ownership and not revealing your beneficial ownership. We have removed bearer share warrants. We demonetize the $100 bill. We introduce amendments to the Proceeds of Crime Act, the financing of terrorism, the economic sanctions order. We amended the law to add in the supervision of nonprofit organizations. We amended the law to treat with where you register your deeds. So we went behind money in three places, cash, land, and corporate structures. And those are things which now form a bedrock. But most importantly, we amended the criminal process in the courts so that you can actually get to court and have white collar matters dealt with. The police started specialist units for white collar crime. The Trinidad and Tobago police has experts out of the United Kingdom. So this public procurement legislation is not just legislation. It's how do you operationalize the law that matters. Mr. Attorney General, we do have just three minutes left with you, and I really want to make really good use time of it. As you speak about the anti-terrorism bill, what happens to those people in Syria who are trying to get back to Trinidad and Tobago? What is it about the law that keeps them in or keep them out? So at present, there's no prohibition under the anti-terrorism law necessarily. There may be investigations ongoing as to how people found themselves there. Once citizens are verified through international processes and local processes as citizens, they have rights and privileges under their citizenship in Trinidad and Tobago. As it relates to anti-terrorism, I can tell you that we have a bill in circulation right now. It's often referred to as the returners legislation. People who are returning from zones of conflict, etc. That bill is something which we are wrapping up consultation on right now. We've received widespread support for that legislation, and we intend, subject to the conclusion of consultation and amendments that come out of that, to go to the cabinet to ask for it to be considered for laying into the parliament. So there are further amendments to come to the law. So is it that with the returners regulation or bill, they'll be able to come back without any difficulty? Those are mutually exclusive right now. Um, there are procedures in place where the information is being passed through the proper channels to ensure that our citizens are in fact our citizens, that people are who they say they are. That is an international process of data communication and flow. And that stands apart from any allegation of terrorism on the one hand. Obviously, we have people who have found themselves in zones of terror and conflict who say that they were members of ISIS. And that, as you know, is a breach of our laws because the support of ISIS is a criminal offense in Trinidad and Tobago. Will these people fall under that, these women and the children who are still in Syria or in Turkey, wherever they are now, would they fall into that category of people who fought on behalf of ISIS or have, have they recognized themselves as members of ISIS? I really couldn't tell you because that depends upon evidence. Evidence depends upon intelligence and information. That is a matter for the um, law enforcement authorities to have through international cooperation, Interpol, etc. So the government does not involve itself in the granularity of evidence. What we will do is we'll be, re we'll be reliant upon the evidence that comes forward. And that's a matter for the international cooperation mechanisms and law enforcement. Okay, well, I'm definitely happy to hear that. We do have to go, but for three-fifth majority legislation, what happens going forward if the United National Congress decides not to support them? 30 seconds. Well, they have consistently refused. I regret that I'm about to say this, but I'll say it anyway. I think this is the way that the opposition intends to try to hurdle or trip the government. They believe that if legislation cannot pass, that the country will essentially fall into a state of some form of chaos that would be good for them. I can't see that as ever being the case. Uh, with that in mind, we will pass the laws that we are capable of passing with the majorities that we have. We will bring special majority when we must, obviously, because you cannot trample upon constitutional rights um, without certain majorities being given. One can only pray for this country that common sense will prevail and that Mrs. Pasabi Sessa will recover into a degree of support into legislation. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, thank you so much for speaking with us this morning.
Thank you so much. Have a great day. Same to you, the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, Farris Delroy, was speaking with us about the failure of the anti-gang legislation in the House on Friday. We take a break and we'll be back with you.